For many decades, people had believed, mostly in the Western world, that the Earth and all life in it were created by a series of natural processes that were easily explained. The belief for a long time had been that the scientific theories of evolution and the Big Bang theory provided a sufficient explanation for the existence of life, matter, and energy. Belief in these theories required simple logic, reason, and observation of evidence. On the other hand, intelligent design theories required essentially blind faith. But new scientific discoveries have now refuted and permanently eliminated both the Darwinian theory of evolution as the origin of life on Earth and the Big Bang theory of the creation of the universe. But before looking at how these twin theories have been removed, let's take a very, very brief glance at how they took hold in the first place. Who exactly is Darwin? Darwin was a man born in 1809 to a pair of cousins, as inbreeding among the wealthy at the time was common practice so that they would not have to intermingle with the inferior common folk. Darwin's parents were cousins, so naturally he would go on to marry his own cousin. He and his cousin produced ten children. As a child, Darwin was a trickster who enjoyed creating elaborate hoaxes, as well as creating and writing out complex secret codes. Charles would fabricate and tell stories to his family and friends, quote, for the pure pleasure of attracting attention and surprise, end quote, and play tricks, such as pretending to find apples he'd hidden earlier and what he would later call a monstrous fable in which he was able to convince a childhood friend that he could change the color of certain flowers by giving them special water. His father, however, was unimpressed with his games, and Charles later recounted that he stopped playing them because no one paid much attention. Darwin's education included little to no training in geology, botany, or zoology. He did attend medical school, however, he dropped out. A quick glance at Darwin's writing reveals a man who, had he lived in modern times, would have been fired from his job, never worked again, and deplatformed from all forms of electronic media for his extraordinary racism and statements about various ethnic and racial groups. Most of his writing appears to be little more than wandering conjecture from a man untrained in his discipline, work which people only believe because they've never read it. If you're a believer in the theories of Charles Darwin and you've never actually read them for yourself, you may want to open a couple of his books. But here are the top 12 Darwin quotes. And while you can read these quotes on the screen in their entirety, for the sake of time, and since Darwin spoke in 19th century English, we can paraphrase each one for you. Please note, where the word civilized appears in these quotes, it means white. 1. Someday, civilized people will exterminate all the other races. 2. When civilized people arrive in other lands, they kick the natives' ass, unless the weather gives the natives a home field advantage. 3. When races of people blend, they get darker and darker. The darker they are, the more vitality they have. This shows how truly different races really are. 4. Native Americans have no concern for the suffering of strangers. Even their women and children enjoy torturing animals as well as people. The old saying is true, never, never trust an Indian. 5. Sense of smell helps animals sense danger and catch prey. Dark-skinned people have a more highly developed sense of smell than civilized people. 6. People will be offended by my conclusion that humans descended from a piece of pond scum. But you have to believe me, because one time I saw some naked brown people with body paint and tangled hair, and I wasn't even ashamed when I realized that the blood of far inferior creatures runs through my veins. 7. Humans are incredibly adaptable to their surroundings, but by humans I mean civilized people. Non-civilized people are like apes. They have never lasted long outside their native environment. 8. Civilized people are far more intelligent than other races. Anyone who has had the chance to carefully compare them has seen the quiet and serious Native American and the light-hearted and talkative black people. 9. It's easy to see men have a greater intellect than women, since they are so much better at everything that requires deep thought, reason, or imagination. 10. The reason men are smarter and more creative than women is probably natural selection because the highest quality men are the ones who are the toughest and best at providing for their wife and kids. 11. The problem with civilized people is, we build asylums to protect the imbecile, have skilled doctors who save the lives of even the weakest members of society, which allows them to reproduce. If you know anything about animal breeding, this is extremely damaging to the human race. No other animal is ignorant enough to allow the weak to reproduce. 12. It appears that wisdom teeth may eventually be phased out in more highly evolved civilized people. On the other hand, round people's wisdom teeth seem larger and fit better in their mouth. Now your first reaction upon reading this is probably the obvious one. Where are all the angry mobs of upper middle class white college age children displaying their commitment to justice and equality by making a public display of ripping the pages out of all the textbooks that contain anything to do with Darwin? Since modern times require that the most moral and virtuous members of society dress up in fascist costumes and march in the streets tackling statues of people that make them uncomfortable, why aren't they marching in protest to prevent this kind of insidious Darwinian evil from making its way into our classrooms and the impressionable young minds of children? And more importantly, why haven't all university professors who teach Darwin been banned or at least shadow banned from electronic media for spreading such hate? Darwin's racism was not the superficial kind, like someone who has had a bad experience with a person from another racial group and then decides to project that experience onto the whole race of people. This kind of racism could easily be changed if a positive experience later replaces the negative one. But not with Darwin. Darwin's was existential racism. His belief was that inferior races are not yet even of the same species and are still evolving toward being human. Now that we have an idea of who Darwin was, let's take a look at what he accomplished. 
In his magnum opus on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life, Darwin imagined a complex theory which can be summarized in this quote. Therefore, I should infer from analogy that probably all the organic beings which have ever lived on this earth have descended from some one primordial form into which life was first breathed. Or to paraphrase, if I were a guessing man, and I am, there was probably a piece of pond scum and someone breathed life into it and eventually all other life forms descended from it. You probably have a list of questions for Darwin after this statement, questions that start with who, what, and why, but Darwin predicts these questions and answers them for you. Here are a few more Darwin quotes which you can read in their entirety on the screen while we paraphrase them for you. You're probably wondering, if my theory were true, why in the hell are there not millions and millions of missing links which connect these constantly changing species? Why aren't these transitional species around us everywhere we look, living, dead, and fossilized? There's not a single piece of evidence, and that's why my theory looks so completely absurd. Darwin then goes on to answer his own question. But I can respond to this irrefutable proof that my theory is utterly useless by saying I guess we just haven't found any missing links yet, and all the experts who point out that we should already have a huge number of them are simply mistaken. Everyone would agree there is no possible way we could have a record of everything, but I am suggesting we don't even have a record of a single thing. And almost no one will buy a story this ridiculous. Almost no one. Darwin then summarizes his work. This work is not perfect. I can't back it up with data or references. Just trust me on this. I know it is full of errors, but I relied on other people who I trusted. So when you find the errors, blame them, not me. I realize I am only offering sweeping generalizations sprinkled in with a few facts. I hope you like it. I promise no one knows like I know how important it is for me to one day publish data which backs up all these wild claims. And someday I may get around to it. I know full well that almost every point I make could be refuted by data, and that I often venture in the exact opposite direction of where the evidence leads. I know it takes facts to back up theories, but I can't possibly do that here. So, although Darwin could offer zero evidence for his theory, and although it matched nothing observed in nature, it caught on like wildfire, and within 10 years, according to some studies, as many as 75% of geologists had accepted Darwin's theory. Aside from Darwin's work, by his own admission having no more value than an 8th grade research project, there are many problems which arise. The scientific method involves careful and skeptical observation, sometimes data collection, followed by the formulation of a hypothesis. Then, through testing, the hypothesis can be refined or eliminated. Instead, Darwin began with the hypothesis, and then spent an entire book telling you why you should probably believe him, even though his hypothesis never aligns with anything observed in nature, which he openly admits. This is closer to a religious text than science. Why would you begin with a hypothesis instead of observation, unless you're motivated by something other than scientific discovery? Shortly after the publication of On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life, Professor Ernst Haeckel, one of the foremost biologists of his time, drew and published a set of embryos which showed how similar human embryos are to various animal embryos. The drawings, according to Haeckel, were, quote, completely exact. The work was received by academia and media with great fanfare. The scientific consensus was in. The theory of evolution had been proven. Later, however, it was discovered that the drawings were deliberately faked by Haeckel. He had removed and added parts to the various embryos to make them appear similar. Over a hundred years later, prominent evolutionist Stefan Gould stated that Haeckel's books, quote, appeared in all major languages and surely exerted more influence than the works of any other scientist, including Darwin, in convincing people throughout the world about the validity of evolution. Incredibly, some government-controlled schools in the 21st century are still using these ridiculous drawings while teaching science class. And Mount Haeckel sits majestically across from Mount Darwin in the California Sierra Nevadas. In 1893, another Ernst, anatomist Robert Ernst Wiedersheim, published his book, The Structure of Man, an Index to His Past History. A masterful work on the evolutionary process which listed at least 180 vestigial human organs. Organs which once served a useful purpose in a creature, but after evolving into a different creature, no longer has any use for the organs. But a small vestige of the former organ remains. With great excitement and fanfare, Wiedersheim's work was received. There could no longer be any debate on the subject, at least not among intelligent people. The scientific consensus was in. Evolution must be true, as it is the only explanation for all these unuseful human vestiges. But unfortunately, one by one, the use was discovered for every single vestige on the list. In one of history's great ironies, Wiedersheim had inadvertently highlighted the fact that there should be countless vestigial organs observed in every creature on Earth, but not a single such organ has ever been discovered in any creature. As time wore on, and no evidence could be found to support Darwin's theory, anxiety grew, until finally in 1912 an important archaeological discovery was made. Finally, the long-awaited discovery of Darwin's missing link, the skull of a transitional ape-man was discovered in Piltdown, England. Once the skull had been collected, an entire imaginary character was drawn around it. Finally, there could be no further debate permitted on the subject. The scientific consensus was in. Piltdown man was half a million years old. Darwin's theory had been proved true, said the front page of the New York Times. Celebrations ensued. School textbooks were reprinted celebrating the discovery of Piltdown man. But unfortunately, it was later discovered that Piltdown man was just a deliberate hoax done by piecing together human and ape skeletal remains. 
Because of the enormous fanfare and media frenzy over the so-called discovery, without ever verifying its authenticity, it took over 40 years for the fakery to be discovered, which could have easily been done in a matter of days or hours if anyone had been interested. Curiously, there was very little coverage once the fakery was revealed. Many people did not even learn Piltdown was a hoax for years after it was discovered. In 1922, 10 years after Piltdown Men was found, the tooth of a pig was discovered in Nebraska. An entire half-ape, half-human, transitional, imaginary creature was then drawn in around the tooth. The scientific community had reached a consensus. Although we expected to see millions of transitional fossils, to back up Darwin, we have one. Oh, wait, we have zero, as further excavation of the site, which for some reason didn't happen for four years, it unfortunately turned out to be just a pig tooth. Later, between 1975 and 2005, anthropologist Reiner Proch von Seeten made numerous groundbreaking archaeological discoveries, including a skull fragment over 36,000 years old, which was said to link humans and Neanderthals. Also, a skull over 27,000 years old, a skull of a woman 21,000 years old, and an ape-man over 50 million years old. Imagine his luck. What are the odds that one man would find so many transitional fossils? He must be very good with a shovel. He enjoyed a distinguished career and received many accolades from his peers. He boasted of properties owned in New York, Florida, and California, and developed an affinity for driving Porsche vehicles, wearing gold watches, and smoking Cuban cigars. The scientific consensus was in. Darwin was correct. There can be no further debate on the subject. One day, one of his peers, Thomas Terberger, decided to take a look at the specimens and verify the dating. Unfortunately, however, he discovered that every single one of them was deliberately dated incorrectly, and for some reason, no one had bothered to check the entire time. Von Zieten's entire collection dated between a few hundred and a few thousand years old. He resigned in disgrace. Finger-pointing ensued in the scientific community. Why did no one verify this guy's work? Come to think of it, who was supposed to verify it? Come to think of it, who verifies any of these discoveries? A quote from Terberger explains not only why everyone believed Von Zieten, but why anyone ever believes Darwin's theory. It may be the case that the community believed these results readily because they fit into an expected picture. This statement explains in a nutshell the entire reason that Darwin's silly, outdated theory still survives. No one actually believes the theory, there's nothing in it to believe. Everyone simply assumes that someone else is verifying it, and no one would have any reason to lie about scientific findings. Anthropology is going to have to completely revise its picture of modern man between 40,000 and 10,000 years ago, said Terberger. The embarrassments for Darwin's theory were beginning to pile up, but the media was undaunted. Time magazine began a series of issues dedicated to imprinting evolutionary theory on the mind of the public. For most of the 20th century, lobbies and doctor's offices, dentists, nail salons, barbershops, lawyers' offices, any lobby or waiting area where magazines were placed, appeared Time's cartoon images of preposterously fake transitional species, ape men, and bold headlines declaring evolution as a fact. Although the images were completely unscientific cartoons, and the stories inside sometimes admitted buried deep within the text that there was actually no science behind any of it, on the magazine covers, the only part most people would ever see were big, bold, evolutionary, theoretical statements made as if they were fact. These images gradually became a part of the public consciousness. Meanwhile, a similarly clever and deceptive tactic was employed on schoolchildren. Pleasant cartoon pictures were presented in textbooks with entire chapters dedicated to Darwin, which always start briefly by mentioning that evolution is only a theory, then going on to make pages and pages of theoretical statements as though they were fact. Then requiring children to recite the theoretical statements as though they were fact, and answer questions about them correctly to pass even though they're not factual at all. Aside from all the evidence ever produced for evolution being intentionally faked or deliberately miscategorized, any other problems exist for Darwin. Let's take a look at them, but first, since Darwin's theory does not match anything observed in nature, for it to make sense, another theory was needed to explain the existence of life, matter, and energy. The Big Bang Theory appears to be very complex, but can actually easily be understood by all. Roughly in 1927, one day, Jesuit Catholic priest Georges Lemaitre was peering through a primitive telescope, while on break during his shift as a priest. While doing so, he theorized that the entire universe appeared to be expanding. For an untestable and unprovable idea like this to make sense, countless additional theories would need to be tacked onto it. It was then suggested that maybe not only was the universe expanding on that day, but may have always been expanding. And what if it had been doing so at the same rate it appeared to be expanding today? Following this logic, it was assumed that if all were true, it probably would have had to begun expanding from a much smaller state and then continued at a constant rate until now. Continuing down this pathway back through time, a big problem arose. If the universe were always expanding at this rate, then at some point every single thing in existence would have had to exist in a much smaller space. In fact, all things would have had to have begun at a single tiny point. Since this defied the laws of physics, it was time to abandon the theory. But rather than follow science and reason, all that was needed to correct this terminal error was to tack on another theory. It was simply presumed that perhaps all things had begun at a very hot, dense singularity, which existed for unknown reasons, contained within it for some reason the magical potential to create all things, and for some reason began expanding. 
Because so many theories to fill the holes in the Big Bang have been put forward to prop it up, and then later were disproven, there's little agreement in the scientific community on what would have happened in the early phases of the imaginary bang. However, the biggest problem for bang is that it's based on Albert Einstein's theory of relativity, a theory which is nonsense if you ask many experts, including Einstein himself. Or you could ask the father of nuclear physics, Ernest Rutherford, Nobel laureate physicists Robert Millikan and Albert Nicholson, Ernst Mach, who the speed of sound is named after, or you could ask Einstein's favorite scientist, Nikola Tesla. Einstein was once asked, what's it like to be the smartest man alive? He stated, I don't know, you'll have to ask Nikola Tesla. It should be noted, Tesla believed theoretical science was a waste of time, once stating, today scientists have substituted mathematics for experiments and they wander off through equation after equation and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. The scientists from Franklin to Morris were clear thinkers and did not produce erroneous theories. The scientists of today think deeply instead of clearly. One must be sane to think clearly, but one can think deeply and be quite insane. When asked about Einstein, Tesla referred to him as a long-haired crank. On the theory of relativity, he stated, Relativity is a massive deception wrapped in beautiful mathematics. Einstein is a beggar dressed in purple clothes and made king using dazzling mathematics that obscure the truth. And there was renowned British physicist Lewis Essen, who in 1971 published his book, The Special Theory of Relativity, A Critical Analysis. He stated with regard to Einstein's relativity, the theory is not a theory at all, but simply a number of contradictory assumptions together with actual mistakes. Students are told that the theory must be accepted, although they cannot expect to understand it. They are encouraged right at the beginning of their careers to forsake science in favor of dogma. No one has attempted to refute my arguments, but I was warned that if I persisted, I was likely to spoil my current prospects. In addition to Essen, Tesla, Rutherford, Millikan, Mickelson, Mach, and many others, many modern scientists whose careers, funding, and livelihood are not based on venturing further down the theoretical rabbit hole, wrote an open letter to the scientific community regarding the Big Bang Theory, which was published in the New Scientist Journal. A few paraphrased excerpts include the following. A lot of things are continually being fabricated to keep the Big Bang Theory alive. Things no one has ever observed. If we don't include this long list of fantasies, the Big Bang Theory is eliminated from the realm of possibility. The theory is not science. You don't keep making up new things to make a theory work. You observe data and eliminate a theory when it does not match any of your observations. Also, the Big Bang Theory has never correctly predicted anything. Instead, parameters keep being adjusted to make it appear that the theory has been correct all along. Alternative theories are not even permitted to be discussed. An open exchange of ideas is lacking in mainstream conferences. Young scientists learn to go along and remain silent or lose their funding. Even new observations are now interpreted through this filter and judged as right if they support the theory or wrong if they don't. This is becoming a religion, not science. Today, funding comes from very few sources and all funding and resources are devoted to Big Bang study. This undermines the scientific method and makes honest research impossible. Allocating funding to investigations into the Big Bang's validity and its alternatives would allow the scientific process to determine our most accurate model of the history of the universe. Here is the list of signatures on the letter. Without the support of Big Bang, Darwin faces some grave difficulties. Without the all-intelligent and all-powerful singularity to account for the existence of life, matter, and energy, where did Darwin get his creatures? Survival of the fittest, Darwin attempts to explain, but what about arrival of the fittest? Where did the first organ come from? Why and how did it develop in the first creature that had it? Which creature had the first lung, and why? Which creature had the first nose? Why and how would the sense of smell come about? How could anything give off a smell in the first place? How did the first sex organ come about? How did creatures reproduce prior to that? Which came first, skin or blood, since both seem to require the other? How did the immune system develop? What about skeletal systems in all creatures? The entire skeletal system is interconnected and works in unison. Did the eye socket come first or the eyeball? How would an eye socket form first unless it had advanced knowledge that an eyeball would come? How and why would an eyeball form unless there was already an eye socket? How did any of these skeletal parts know what was coming so they could evolve correctly to fit with the connecting part? At both ends, no less. Bones of every creature work with perfection, keeping them balanced, allowing them to stand, move, run, walk, jump, crawl, dig, roll, and climb. All the big questions, the obvious ones, are always ignored completely. While highly complex imaginary processes are invented to explain away the small questions. In addition, the entire theory hinges on the concept that random mutation created all plant and animal life even though random mutation is usually the cause of random, unpredictable errors that cause crippling disease, loss of function, and often the destruction of the host organism. If you try to find evidence of mutation leading to new species, there's astonishingly little. And what is claimed to be evidence for this is controversial. It would be an extraordinary leap to project such a finding over the entire existence of all living things. 
Essentially, it would require extraordinary faith to believe in such a process. Also, no evidence has ever been discovered which proves mutations to be random. This is an assumption made to assist Darwinism. Evidence has, however, been found to suggest that mutations are not at all random. One study demonstrated four different populations of bacteria independent from each other exhibiting the same mutation in the same gene. And how about cells? In Darwin's time, a cell was thought to be an unsophisticated blob of goo like jello. It was not known that there was incredibly complex information coded into matter. This critical error is understandable since cells are so small they could not properly be observed at the time. So small, in fact, that roughly 10,000 could fit on the head of a pin. Despite their microscopic size, every single cell contains enough information to fill 4,000 books. If all of the information in the cells of just one adult human were written out into book form, there would be enough books to completely fill the Grand Canyon 75 times. But it's even more impressive if you look within the cell. Each cell is like a tiny city, but far more efficient and with less crime. Each has walls, a transportation system, streets, a recycling center, a power source, and a library. And there are tiny machines operating with extraordinary engineering in their design. The flagellar motor is one example and used by some bacteria to swim. A rotary motor which can operate at 100,000 RPMs and is one one hundred thousandth of an inch long. It operates a lot like an outboard motor, helping bacteria move through sticky substances. It is made of at least 30 protein parts. All 30 parts are essential for the operation of the motor. All 30 parts, therefore, would have had to come together at the same time and be assembled in the correct way. The existence of this and other molecular machines are just one of many proofs which permanently eliminate and refute Darwin's theory of evolution. Also, unbeknownst to Darwin, it would later be revealed that inside the cell is more proof of highly intelligent design, DNA. Proteins, which are the building blocks of life, consist of amino acids. To build the chain of amino acids which forms the protein, they must be placed in a very precise order. How do the amino acids know which order to assemble? Because of DNA. DNA uses a four-letter chemical alphabet and is the software that provides the instructions for the cell's machinery on how to correctly assemble amino acids to build proteins. Incredibly, DNA cannot function without 75 pre-existing proteins. But proteins are produced only by DNA. So this is a complete system which could have only come into place all at once. And DNA's complex instruction program would only be useful if systems were already in place inside the cell that could read and understand it and execute the coded instructions. This ingenious system proves that life does not only consist of matter and energy, it also contains information. And information can only come from a conscious and intelligent source. DNA is similar to a computer program, except much more complex. Said Bill Gates, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. No one has ever seen matter itself give rise to a code. At this point, the Darwinist is faced with serious reflection. If Gates, one of the most intelligent human programmers who ever lived, says that the DNA code was written by someone vastly more intelligent than he is, how does any Darwinist argue against intelligent design? The belief is laughable given the existing evidence. To suggest that a completed system of this complexity and precision fell into place by accident and for no reason is as unscientific as you could possibly get. And perhaps Darwin can explain the existence of male and female. Any random mutation process would not produce two genders, both of which are required for reproduction. Why wouldn't such random processes produce dozens of genders, or thousands? The male and female reproductive systems are extraordinarily complex and precise. Are we to believe they evolve separately but function together the way they do? And that it happened at random without purpose? How exactly did reproduction occur before these systems evolved into place? The odds that even a single species would evolve on its own into two different genders and that both would be required for reproduction and then it would stop there, not three, four, or fifty genders, the odds are zero. How much lower then are the odds that the same thing would happen to two different species? And how much lower still that random mutation would cause this to happen in every single species on Earth? Consciousness, intelligence, feelings, morality, empathy, why and how did these non-material phenomena come about in a strictly material world? The fact that humans are conscious and aware of their surroundings and capable of learning, dreaming, happiness, sadness, excitement, does not quite fit at all, and in fact, seems impossible with an evolutionary materialist, mechanical worldview, but fits perfectly with intelligent design. And nutrients, which contain energy, foster tissue growth, tissue repair, bone strength, digestion, it's laughable to even suggest that a single nutrient could come into place by chance, but dozens is proof. How could animals and plants find precisely the nutrients they need to survive in their environments? The reality is, you could give the most intelligent man who ever lived, all the money and all the machines that ever existed, a thousand years to work with, and he could not create a grain of sand. He could only play with the materials which are already in existence. And if the most intelligent man cannot create a single thing, how much less likely that unintelligent chance can create every single thing? The odds are far better that a space shuttle would assemble and launch itself into orbit. Seemingly, the most effective argument Darwinists have come up with is to evade the argument altogether. Their favorite tactic is to ridicule and pretend all these matters have been settled by far more intelligent persons, and this debate is old and it has been over. 
and when you research and find out what these alleged answers are, they're always little more than speculation and more and more theories tacked onto untestable and unobservable theories. What they usually mean when they say the debate is over is that the debate has been shut down, not that it's been held. They never quite seem to notice that it's actually an incoherent set of beliefs they have. To say that there are fixed natural laws like the laws of physics, but also to say that all things came into being at random, without cause, and are unconscious without purpose. In fact, to apply natural laws which are a. not physical, b. act on the physical and therefore predate the physical, and c. created the physical from nothing, is actually just a description of intelligent design. The Darwinist requires for his theories the intelligent design that he ridicules. Anyone thinking critically and observing the world around them can see that the earth and everything in it were very clearly created by extraordinary intelligence far beyond that of humans. But we don't know the answers to the mysteries of creation, and that's part of the beauty of life. But just because we don't know the answers does not mean that making things up gets us any closer to the truth. In fact, it only prevents us from looking or asking the bigger questions. Or thinking.